<laughs> so, um, all right, so we are turning in assignment one today. It's due by midnight. Um, does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask? No. We're feeling, I know there's a bunch of, I know they've seen a bunch of submissions go through on Canvas, and I've got a couple hard copies already, so. Um, assignment two is ready, and I decided to make that due next week on Friday instead of Wednesday. Um, I don't uh, know exactly, like I'm kind of formulating a plan for next week. Some of these problems on this assignment um, are a little bit difficult. There's some uh, equations that are separable if you make a substitution. There are equations that we can solve by using a technique we're learning today. And then there's like a couple of like applied problems that might take a little bit of doing to work out. So um, what I think I'll do for next week is um, cover some new material during class each day and then reserve the rest of the class for folks to kind of work on problems while I'm around to answer questions. So I, I didn't want to just do, oh, Monday's new class and Wednesday's working or vice versa because um, I want to be able to have some working time while I'm in the room with students in both locations. Um, so just to give you an idea that there will be some time uh, set aside during class um, for you to just actually work on stuff, you know, work together, ask me questions um, on both days. Um, are there any questions about I just barely posted the assignment, so maybe you haven't seen it yet, but there's like six problems. Okay. So if we're all good to go, if we're all ready to go, let's, um, let's kind of pick up where we left off. We had just been learning what it means for an equation to be linear. So we're, again, we're focusing on the first order equation, so it just involves the first derivative. And, um, and so what makes an equation linear is that I have like, I can write it, I can write it in this form. Maybe I have to do some algebra first, but I can write it in this form. And this form is x prime just times one, like that's by itself. And then we have x, our function x times maybe some function of t. It can be multiplied by t stuff, but it can't be multiplied by any x stuff. Right? Or I can't have any other functions of x, like sine x or e to the x or something. And then it's just equal to some function of t on the other side. Um, if that function of t is 0, and, I, and here's a typo uh, right here, that should be q of t, not q of x. If it's set equal to 0 on the other side, then we say it's homogeneous. And then we got some practice just identifying, right? So. Um, the first one was linear after rearranging it. There's our function of t is just the um, constant function 3. This was linear because we just had x times sine of t. That's fine. It's a function of t. This next one is not linear because we have an e to the x. So I just need x times some function of t. So I have e to the x. That's a problem. And the last one, nonlinear because we had a, a term of 1 over x, also a problem. Um, if the first order linear is homogeneous, then it's also separable, and we can solve it. So let's solve this generic first order linear homogeneous differential equation. And I'm going to start uh, just by isolating the x prime. So I'm going to write this as dx dt. I'm going to throw the other term on the other side. So dx dt is a negative p of t times x. And I can separate the variables. Uh, so I multiply by dt over x. And when we do that, we're left with dx over x equals negative p of t dt. What would we do at this point? I mean, we have a generic function, p of t, so don't, don't worry about that not being specific right now. But what would we do at this point if we were trying to solve? Integrate. Integrate. Yeah, let's do it. Um, on the left, what do we get? And then just a reminder for folks in Williston, go ahead and turn on, make sure your mics are on if you uh, say something. Come on, absolute X ln absolute x. And then on the other side, we don't have a specific function. So it's just 
I'm going to pull the negative outside, negative integral P of T, whatever, oops, whatever that function is. So then absolute x is e to the negative integral p of t dt. Um, and if we choose uh, some uh, simplest, usually we say we'll choose the simplest antiderivative of p of t. So if I'll say capital P of t is simplest antiderivative of little p of t, then x, uh, x of t, our function, is e to the p of t, or negative p of t. Um, I'm missing a constant, c times e to the negative p of t. So we know if we know how to integrate that function, p of t, we know how to get a solution to this equation. Um, so, you know, here's an example. This is linear. This function is linear. Convince yourself. Can somebody um, offer an explanation as to why this equation is linear? Yeah, if, you know, so we have x prime by, you know, is, is kind of an isolated term up front, and then the function x is just being multiplied by a function of t. So if that were a cosine of x, it would not be linear, but it's cosine of t, so that's fine. It's a linear function. Can somebody point out why we know it's homogeneous? Because q of t is zero. Yeah. Is, is your mic on? Yeah. Good. Perfect. So yeah, because it's set equal to zero, so that's what makes it homogeneous. So if we were to use what we just figured out just above, then in this case, the function little p of t is cosine of t and negative integral p of t is negative sine t if we choose the simplest antiderivative so th I, that's the one where I just suppose that that constant is zero and then using this form up here that we derived that means that x of t is some constant c times e to the negative sine t. And we would get the same result if we actually separated the variables right there. You know, like if we could solve that equation just by separating the variables. We've done a few problems like that, and that's what it would end up being. We'd, we'd integrate a dx over x, and we'd get a ln of absolute, and, you know, we'd get that same thing. Um, so if the linear first order is homogeneous, then every time you use separation of variables, it'll work that way. So, you know, there's sort of, I guess, a little bit of a shortcut. Um, if it's not homogeneous, meaning that if it's not set equal to zero, um, it's a, it takes a little bit more doing. If it's not homogeneous, then chances are good that it might not be separable even. Um, but we can make use of something called an integrating factor. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about how we figure out what that integrating factor is in a bit, but let's start with an example. And I'm just going to say, let's go ahead and multiply this equation 
by the function e to the 2t. One thing that's really important when you choose an integrating factor and something that's really important about e to the 2t or e to the anything is that that is always a positive function. I'm multiplying both sides of this equation by a, something, a function that's always positive. So it's not going to affect any of the solutions, the function solutions. So if we multiply both sides by e to the 2t, Then I'm going to distribute on the left. So we have x prime times e to the 2t plus, and now I'm going to choose a clever way to rearrange these factors in the second one, uh, 2 e to the 2t times x. I'm just choosing to put the 2 out front, which I guess is not that out of the ordinary. We often put the 2 uh, the coefficient out front, but I, I want the 2 grouped to the e to the 2t. And on the other side, e to the 2t times e to the negative 2t is just 1, so we just have t. Now we're going to make a clever observation. Um, take a look at what we have on the left side here. Note that the derivative of e to the 2t is 2 times e to the 2t, right? It's e to the stuff times the derivative of the stuff. So what I have here is the derivative of x times e to the 2t plus the derivative of e to the 2t times x. What does that sound like? Product rule. Yeah, is your mic on? Product rule. It sounds like the product rule. It sounds like, so this, uh, this is what we get. when we use the product rule to find the derivative with respect to t of x times e to the 2t. Cool. So I'm just going to replace the stuff in the blue box with the derivative with respect to t of x times e to the 2t. So e to the stuff here, so it's not only is it a positive function, a function that will be positive for all values of t, which means it's not going to affect the solution functions that we find. Um, but since e to the stuff is its own derivative, more or less, um, we can end up seeing like the uh, product rule. We end up seeing the product rule fall out of this. It was kind of important that we chose e to the 2t because we wanted that factor of 2 to match up with the derivative of the stuff in the exponent up there in order to make the, uh, in order to, to, for that to be the product, the, the result of the product rule. Um, okay, so now I've got the derivative with respect to t of this stuff on the left side and I've got t on the right side. Well, let's integrate both sides with respect to t. What should I get on the left side? X e to the 2t. Yeah, I'm integrating the derivative. So that just undoes it. So I should have x times e to the 2t. And what about the left side? I'm not hearing anything from, I don't know if you're, if, if you're suggesting a result in Randolph, but I can't, uh, I can't actually uh, hear you. I see the hands waving around. Uh, t squared over 2. There we go, yeah. T squared over 2 or 1 half T squared. Uh, yeah. And then plus a constant. I want to solve for x, so... Um, that's pretty simple right now. Just divide by e to the 2t, or um, I'm, I guess I'll write it as multiplying by e to the negative 2t. So 
So then x, or x of t, our function, is e to the negative 2t times 1 half t squared plus some constant. You could distribute the e to the negative 2t or leave it factored out. There's fine, but this is a general solution. So this e to the 2t that we picked in the very beginning, we said let's multiply both sides by e to the 2t. We call that an integrating factor. We denote um, we denote it with the uh, by writing mu of t, the Greek letter mu. That's pretty standard. So um, on the next page, we sort of look at this general um, uh, procedure here, how we pick mu of t, um, and then just kind of outlining the procedure that we used on the last page. So we start with our linear equation in standard form. So we have x prime times 1. We have x times maybe some function of t and then some function q of t on the other side. It's all about, once it's in this standard form, you really, it's all about this guy right here. Um, we want to find the simplest antiderivative of p of t. Here we're calling it capital P of t. Um, and that integrating factor is going to be e raised to that power. We're just, it's that exponential, um, that exponential function. So that's how we pick mu of t, and then we multiply both sides by mu of t. If we've chosen that correctly, then what we have on the left side should just be the result of having taken the derivative using the product rule of x times uh, mu of t. So like we saw like on this one, right? So we picked e to the 2t, and what we got on the left side in that blue box was just the derivative. That's the, using the product rule on x times e to the 2t. Um, and uh, and then we integrate both sides with respect to t. Make sure we add a constant, and uh, and then usually we just have to divide through by mu of t at the end to get x of t. So let's do some examples. The first thing we want to do is make sure that we are in standard form. So I'm going to throw the x on the other side. So this is x prime minus x equals t e to the t. What is p of t in this equation? Negative 1. Negative 1. Great. So then the integral of p of t is negative t, the integral of negative 1 dt. So that's negative t plus c. We're going to choose the simplest antiderivative. Um, so mu of t is e to the negative t. Just ignore the constant. So now we pick mu of t. We're going to multiply both sides by e to the negative t. When we do that, we have x prime times e to the negative t minus e to the negative t times x. On the other side, simplifying, we just get t. That's pretty nice. When you multiply through by um, an integrating factor, 
it's uh, it's guaranteed that the right side will only just be some function of t. So you're not going to have x's and t's mixed together on the right side. Um, this technique, of course, hinges on being able to actually integrate that. Um, but we have lots of techniques of integration. We don't need a big technique of integration here on the right side. It's just a power rule again. Um, what are we looking at on the left side? What is that the derivative of? Yeah, that's what we get if we use the product rule to find the derivative of x times e to the negative t. So now we're ready to integrate both sides with respect to t. What do we get on the left? Yeah. Oops. Just x times e to the negative t. And then 1 half t squared plus some constant. And then we can multiply through by e to the t to solve for x. So x of t is e to the t times 1 half t squared plus a constant. Questions on uh, this example or the last one? Let's do another. Uh, this is an initial value problem. So we're going to find the you know, general solution, and then we can figure out what that constant is. Um, what do we have to do first here? Isolate the derivative. Yeah, so we'll divide through by t. So then x prime plus, now I'm going to write this next term as 1 over t times x equals cosine t over t. I'm writing it that way because it lets me more easily see it and confirm that it is in fact linear because I just have x times some function of t. Also, it should help me pick out the um, integrating factor. How do we pick that integrating factor? It's at what? One over t. So that's p of t, little p of t. So how do we pick the integrating factor from that? Take the simplest antiderivative of that. Okay. So 
integral 1 over t dt is what? Yeah. Yeah. So if I if I'm going to drop the c and I'm going to drop the absolute values too. I'm going to pick the simplest antiderivative. Any an antiderivative just some function whose derivative is equal to 1 over t. So ln t with no absolute values will do it. So I'm going to pick capital P of t is ln t. So what do I do with that? You multiply both sides by that? Not by that, but uh, we're on the right track. It's stuck on, you better. You're, no, no, I'm just saying, <laughs> leave it on, just like keep, keep saying stuff. E to the ln t. Ah, there we go. So mu of t is e to the ln t. What's e to the ln t? It's just t. It's just t. So we're going to multiply both sides by t. Is anybody else amused by the fact that we got in standard form by dividing everything through by t, and now we're like, perfect, now let's multiply by t. We just figured it out. Okay, <laughs> let's multiply by t. And I, I guess maybe I am the only person amused by that, but whatever. So t times x prime plus 1 times x is equal to cosine t. I'm writing it as 1 times x on purpose. Really, I, for me, on purpose so I could see, I want to see 1 as just the derivative of t, right, with respect to t. So the left side is what we get if we were to use the product rule to find the derivative of tx with respect to t. So it's the derivative with respect to t of t times x. This is cosine of t. And now we can integrate with respect to t. So on the left side, we get tx. On the right side, what's the integral of cosine? Sine. Sine. Negative sine. It is actually positive sine. Positive. The, the, der, um, the derivative of cosine is negative sine. The, uh, the integral of cosine is positive sine. Um, and now we just divide by t. So x of t mm -hmm. is 1 over t times sine t plus a constant. Um, we should observe that this is valid as long as uh, t is not equal to zero. And they gave us some initial conditions. So let's use the fact that x of 1 is equal to 2 to figure out what c is. So 2 is equal to, if, x, if t is 1, then 1 over t is 1 times sine of 1 plus c. And if we solve that for c, then I guess we get 2 minus sine of 1. Which I'm just going to leave written that way. If you, I mean, there's, I don't think there's much of a reason to approximate it, but if you were to approximate it, we just need to understand that uh, that's one radian and not one degree. Um, so we get our particular solution. Looking like that. Um, so when, before we put this example behind us, um, some of the problems will ask you to talk about the behavior 
of the function as t approaches infinity. And really, this is sort of what it sounds like. It's just a limit. So so what happens if we let t grow without bound? We just want to see, like, what is x of t? Does it approach any value? Does it blow up? Like, approaches zero. And why does it approach zero? Over t front. Certainly, the factor of 1 over t approaches 0. The only thing we want to take care of is say, well, what about this? Does that counteract the diminishing behavior of 1 over t? Because what if that blows up faster than 1 over t goes to 0, right? That's just going to oscillate there, right? Yeah, right. So, so sine of t is bounded, right? Sine of t is always between negative 1 and 1. So that means as t approaches infinity, x of t approaches 0. that? So there's a couple problems on the new assignment where you're going to be using an integrating factor to help you solve an equation. So you might find these examples helpful. There's some practice exercises in this section that should be helpful and I'm pretty, I'm just going to double check. I'm pretty sure I've already posted those from Monday. Yeah, so that's from the 2.3 or oh. I put, yes, two point, I'm pretty sure, yes, 2.3, those are the right exercises. Um, so you should, you should have some good resources to help you out with those problems, and of course I'm available to answer questions. Um, so now I'm going to spend the time we have left um, talking about a particular type of application, single compartment mixing. So imagine that um, you have a tank, like of water, and the ones that we're going to look at are where we have like some salt mixed in. You know, consider salt to be a pollutant or a contaminant. Sometimes maybe you want salt if you've got a salt water tank. But um, you have a certain amount of salt or a certain concentration of salt in the water, and you're trying to change that concentration, either raise it or lower it by mixing in uh, water. So like in example, in this first example, it says that we have a fish tank that has 150 liters of water with 20 grams of salt that's dissolved in it. And they, we need to like increase the, um, the concentration to one gram per liter because of some species of fish that likes that concentration. So the way that they do that is they just start mixing in. They have like an intake of water with a higher concentration of salt. And they're at the same time, they're letting water drain out. So in this scenario, we imagine that as soon as the water that's, that is, enters the tank, it's thoroughly mixed, right? So there's a simplifying assumption. Um, and the idea, or the, the question is, at what point does the tank reach the desired level of concentration? So the idea behind, um, or, or the general rule that we want to use, is that the rate of change of pollutant per unit time, like grams per hour or per minute, I guess I think we're using in this problem, is just the rate in minus the rate out. It's a pretty simple like concept. I think we're on board with that. So we have, um, we've got 150 liters with 20 grams of salt. So we're starting with a concentration of 20 grams per 150 liters. Um, and we want to uh, change that to one gram per liter. We're going to do that by, by allowing super concentrated water at three grams per liter allowed to run into the tank at two liters per second. And water is just going to flow out of the tank at the same rate. And we're going to figure out when is the tank going to reach this desired concentration. So I'm just going to kind of jot down what I mentioned before. We assume that the salt is thoroughly mixed, that the mixture is like thoroughly stirred as we 
uh, as soon as it enters the tank. So the concentration is instantaneously the same throughout the tank. So we're going to let um, x of t be the grams of salt in the tank. So just the amount of salt, not the concentration itself. The amount of salt in the tank at time t. So the rate of change of x, the rate at which the amount of salt is changing, dx dt, we're going to use just this <coughs> this general rule up here, rate in minus rate out. And the rate in grams per minute, grams of salt per minute, is going to be given by, so for the rate in, I'm going to take the liters per minute, so two liters per minute, times, and what was the concentration of what's going in? Uh, three grams of salt per liter, times three grams per liter. That's the rate in. Note that the units cancel, the liters cancel, so that is grams per minute. And flowing out at the same rate of two liters per minute, But the concentration is going to be whatever the concentration is at the tank at that particular time, which is the amount of salt, x of t, over the volume of the tank. Grams per liter. In this particular instance, the volume of the tank is constant at 150 liters, so we can plug that in. So we get, uh, let's see, two, uh, sorry, two times three is six, minus, and then we have two times x of t over 150. I'm going to pause there for a moment and see if there are uh, questions. So now um, I'm going to just reduce that fraction. dx dt is 6 minus x of t over 75. There is more space. We, we got a little bit more work to do, but there is. I did allow for more space for this problem. Um, this is linear. It's also separable, um, so we could sort of take our pick. Um, we're going to do one that, that, re that, that's not separable after this. So I'll go ahead and just solve it by separation of variables. I'm going to start on the next page. I'm going to scroll down, but if you need me to scroll back up, just give a shout if you're not finished writing. So we've got dx dt is 6 minus x over 75. 
I'm going to write this as a single fraction, so um, 6 times 75 is... Four fifty. So this is four fifty minus x all over seventy five. If we separate the variables, um, what does the resulting equation look like? So it'll be 75 dx over 450 minus x. Yeah, um, I'm going to leave the 75 on the other side, like this. So I think it'll make it might make the the result a little bit easier. 1 over 75 dt, right? And at this point, since we've separated the variables, we can integrate. Um, what do we get on the left side when we integrate that? Is it just negative long? Absolute 450 minus x? Yeah. Negative ln absolute 450 minus x equals, and that would just be 1 over 75 times t plus a constant. So now we have an equation we can solve for x, right? That's our next goal. Um, I think what I'll do is use that property that says, well, we can bring this up as a power on that. So this is ln absolute 450 minus x to the minus 1. And when we do that, now if we exponentiate both sides, um, the left side is just 1 over absolute 450 minus x. And the right side is e to the 1 over 75t plus c1. And we know, we've, we've seen this happen like several times now. Um, when we're adding in the exponent, that's multiplied by e to the c1. And we can drop the absolute values if we change that to an arbitrary constant c that's allowed to be positive or negative. So 1 over 450 minus x is some constant c times e to the 1 over 75t. So that's 1 over 450 minus x. I'm just going to flip both sides. So 450 minus x is 1 over c e to the 1 over 75t. Or maybe more convenient to write it as 1 over c times e to the negative 1 over 75 and then we can isolate x. Uh, add x to both sides, subtract the exponential term. So we end up with x of t is equal to 450 minus 1 over c e to the negative 1 over 75 t. So here's a general solution for how many grams of salt are in the tank at a given time. We want the specific solution. What information did they give us that tells us, um, I don't know, this gives us something we can use to figure out what C is equal to?
Um, I, I can tell you're saying something, but it's not coming through. So somebody with a with a working mic can maybe like speak on his behalf or something. I see that the green light is on. I, I don't know what to tell you. I t definitely can't hear you. I don't know why it's not uh, connected. Is it the initial condition? Yeah, right, okay. So what was the initial condition? Twenty grams. Yeah, 20, 20 grams at, at uh, zero minutes. Um, you know when you're turning on the mic. So I'm gonna I'm gonna step away from this problem for just a second and talk to the folks specifically in Randolph because I know that the wireless mics are a frustrating thing and I I know that there are plans. I'm pretty sure there are plans to replace them with wired mics. That'll be much nicer. But when you put in the batteries and you turn the mic on, um, there's a little. Each mic is numbered. And if you look on the audio rack, there's a little like LED display or, or not, probably not LED, but anyway, there's a little display for each microphone number. And you can even see like as you turn the microphone on, you'll see a picture of um, like an antenna pop up on the little screen that tells you that the audio mixer has picked up that microphone. And I think there's one mic where when I turn it on, that thing doesn't show up, which means it's not connecting. All the others work, so maybe you just ended up with the one that's not connecting. So I always look at that as I turn the microphones on to try to match up and see that, that it's actually connected. So anyway, sorry about that. Um, but yeah, we're gonna use the initial condition, which is that there are 20 grams of salt initially. Um, so X of zero equals 20. And that gives us 20 equals 450 minus just 1 over C, I guess, right? Because E to the 0 is 1. If we subtract 450 from both sides, we get negative 430 equals negative 1 over C. And that will lead us to C is 1 over 430, positive. Awesome. So now I'm going to, I've got all this space on the other half of my paper here. So I'm going to scroll up to finish this problem. I'm going to wait and make sure uh, folks have had a chance to kind of write down where we are to this point and also just check in to see if there are questions on how we, how we got this far. Okay. So knowing that C is 1 over 430, we have X of T is 450 minus 430 E to the negative T over 75. All right, C is 1 over 430, so 1 over, I guess I just needed 1 over C and not... <laughs> not C in order to get the particular solution. Um, so now we wanted to know how long it takes to get to the, for the concentration to reach, reach one gram per liter. So we want to know X of T over 150 equals one. So that is, our x of t is 450 minus 430 e to the negative t over 75 all over 150 equals 1. And of course that means that x of t is going to be 150. And there's a nice um, exponential equation to solve. Um, so we're going to isolate, we're going to get out our constants on one side, we're going to isolate the E to the stuff and, you know, use a natural log to help us solve for 2. So if I subtract 450 we get negative 300 and then we'll divide both sides by negative 430 So E to the negative T over 75 is a positive 30 over 43. And if we 
take lawn on both sides. We have negative t over 75 is equal to ln of 30 over 43, and then divide by or, or multiply by negative 75. So t is negative 75 ln 30 over 43. Twenty seven point zero 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 two. So I'll call that twenty seven, approximately twenty seven minutes for the tank to reach one gram per liter. Now I'm gonna um, on so let's see before we talk about the next one. Are there questions on how we solve this one? The next one's related, is sort of an extension of this problem. So I just want to check in, see if there are questions on how we set it up or worked through it. Okay. Can you explain again how you got? Um X over 75. Oh. Six minus X over 75. Like this, this uh, up here? Yes. So um, on the first page, we were you okay right here? Where we had 2 times X of T over 150? Yes. So then uh, 2 goes into 150 uh, 75 times. I just reduced. Uh, other questions? Okay. All right. Um, so this next problem is an extension of this one. And um, it took 27 minutes to get to that desired concentration. So if we wanted to speed that up, if we don't want it to take so long, one option would be just increase the input flow rate. But maybe we don't, maybe we're not in a position to increase the, the output flow rate. Maybe it's just out coming out through like a hole that we don't have much control over or something. So if we imagine that we could increase the input flow rate to two and a half liters per minute, but that the output Put flow rate can't be increased, so it's st it's it stays at two liters per minute. Certainly, that'll affect the concentration faster. Um, however, the volume's increasing as well, right? The uh, there's two and a half going in, two going out, so the volume is increasing at half a liter per minute. So the question is, if this tank has a capacity of 160 liters, will we reach that desired concentration before it overflows? Um, this is a more interesting problem because the volume is not fixed, right? One of the things that made the last one not so bad was that the volume was fixed at 150. Now we're going to have a function for volume. And the function for volume is simple. It's linear. We could find that. But that's going to affect what the concentration function is overall. And it's going to affect what our differential equation looks like. So um, our x prime of t, right, that rate, is still rate in minus rate out. And we have the rate in at two and a half liters per minute times three grams per liter. So that's still grams per minute. There's the rate in minus the rate out, two liters per minute volume change. And then X of T over the volume uh, grams per liter. So x of t is still just going to be a variable x, but now the volume is um, changing. So the input 
is increased to two and a half. The output is still two. So the volume starts at 150 liters and is increasing at one half liter per minute. So our volume function, V of T, is 150 plus one half T. And this is what's going to go there. So we get x prime of t. Two and a half times three is seven and uh, seven point five minus. Now we have two times x of t, or two x, over the volume, which is one fifty plus one half t. I'm going to pause there for a moment and see. Um, if there are questions. Okay. I'm going to simplify this fraction. I don't like fractions within fractions, so I'm going to zap the top and the bottom by a factor of two. So we get 7.5 minus 4x over, what, 300 plus t? Now this function, or this equation rather, is not separable, but it is linear. So let's get it in that standard form. Um, which just means I'm going to throw that fraction, 4x over 300 plus t, on the other side. And when I do that, um, plus, I'm going to write it as the function of t times x. So I'm going to write this as the fraction 4 over 300 plus t times x. And then leave the 7.5 on the other side. If it's linear, what can we do? Like, what would... No, it's not separable, but since it is linear, like, what is our path forward? Piece of yeah, right, so we're going to find that integrating factor. So, um, uh, so here's our P of T is 4 over 300 plus T. So mu of T is E to the integral or simplest antiderivative. What is the integral of 4 over 300 plus t? Uh, and, and by integral, I mean a s simple antiderivative. Is it 4 times ln absolute 300 plus t? 4 times ln, and I'm picking the simplest antiderivative, so I'm going to ditch the absolute values, 300 plus t. And if you didn't already, uh, mm -hmm. just make sure you turn on your mic.
What's that going to be equal to? Can we simplify that? Plus yeah, 300 plus 2 to the 4th, because, you know, we're doing a couple things at once, I guess, right? We're going to use that um, property that says I can take that coefficient in front of a log and throw it up as an exponent on the stuff inside. And then E raised to the ln of stuff is just the stuff, because they are inverse functions of each other. So our mu of t is 300 plus t all to the 4th. So we're going to multiply both sides by 300 plus t to the fourth. On the left, we're going to distribute. So we have x prime times 300 plus t to the fourth plus, now when I distribute that, the 300 plus t to the fourth, one of those factors is going to cancel with a 300 plus t in the bottom. So we'll have 4 times 300 plus t to the third times x. And then on the other side, we have 7.5 times 300 plus t to the fourth. Um, so now is a good time for me to admit that I was so clever. I felt really good about myself. I was really clever with the last problem by planning ahead for the extra room we were going to need to do the whole problem. This solution isn't going to fit all on this page, and I neglected to add another page to, uh, to the notes. So if you have another sheet of paper, you're probably going to need it. Um, How does this go? I mean, we multiplied through by the integrating factor. So if we did that part correctly, what should we be looking at on the left side? Rule. Yeah, right. It's, that's, can you turn on your mic and say that again, John? Product rule. Yeah, that's, that is the result of using the product rule to find the derivative of 300 plus t to the fourth times x. So this is the derivative with respect to t of 300 plus t to the fourth times x. And now we're ready to integrate. Integrate both sides with respect to t. So we integrate the derivative, we just uh, get 300 plus t to the fourth times x. And over here, um, it's just a power rule, right? Um, so the stuff to a power is just 300 plus t. That derivative of that stuff is 1, so we don't need any correcting factors. So using the power rule, we get 7.5 times 300 plus t to the fifth all over 5 plus some constant. And 7 and a half divided by 5 is 1.5. And now we're not too far from solving for x. Just divide through by 300 plus t to the fourth. I'm going to split that up on that fraction up on the right side. So um, we'll have, let's see, x of t is equal to 1.5 times 300 plus t just to the first plus 
some constant c, 1 over 300 plus t to the fourth. I'm going to pause there for a moment and just see if anybody has questions on how we got this far. What do we use to find that constant? X of zero equals 20. Yeah, right. We know we start with 20 grams of salt in the tank. So since X of zero is 20, that means that 20 is 1.5. If t is 0, this is just 1.5 times 300 plus c 1 over 300 to the fourth. Um, 1.5 times 300 is 450. And that gives us Negative 430 is equal to C1 over 300 to the fourth. And we get for our constant, C1 is negative 430 times 300 to the fourth. So we could say that we've got our particular solution in terms for, for x of t, right? 1.5, 300 plus t. C1 is a negative, so it'll be a minus 430 times 300 to the fourth over 300 plus t to the fourth power. Um, so we now have a function that tells us how much salt is in the tank at time t, which means we're a little bit closer to being able to solve the problem. The problem was, is this concentration going to reach one gram per liter before it overflows? So the way that we're going to solve this, and, and we're going to have to wait till Monday to get through it because it, it's going to take a little bit more doing, but the idea is we can use this equation to figure out how long it takes for the concentration to get to one gram per liter and then compare that to, well, what's the volume at that time? And if the volume at that time is more than 160, then it will have overflowed before it gets there. Um, the equation that we have to solve is a little bit more involved because now the volume isn't fixed at 150. The volume is a function of time as well. Um, but we made a lot of progress through this and we will finish on Monday. Good work, everybody. Um, let me know if you have questions on assignment one. Um, if you have trouble, I mean, I've gotten a lot of submissions, so I'm assuming the submission process is going fairly smoothly. Um, and I'll see you all on Monday. Um, we're going to do a little bit of work and then um, probably spend a little bit of time working in class. I'm going to do that both Monday and Wednesday so folks get some time uh, with me working on the assignment.